Tonight, I am so happy to have Minerva Cuavez, a conceptual artist based in Mexico City, here to share her practice as a resourceful and inspired socially engaged artist. Mexico City is Minerva's base, um, but uh, generating projects in response to politically charged contexts, her work takes her to locations across the globe. Regularly invited to participate in institutional and artist projects and awarded um, artist residency, min residencies, Minerva has traveled the world with residencies um, from the Museum of World Cultures in Frankfurt um, to the Banff Center um, for the Arts in Alberta, Canada, just to name a couple. In 2003, she was selected for the prestigious DAAD Artist Residency in Berlin. Um, and recent international solo exhibitions include shows at the Museum um, of the City of Mexico and um, the uh, Curie Matsu, uh, Matsuto Gallery in Mexico City, uh, Whitechapel Gallery in London, uh, the Van Abe Museum in, um, in Doven, um, and the Kunstsaal uh, Basel in Basel. Um, she, is also, she has also been included in significant group exhibitions that span the globe, such as um, at the Guggenheim in New York, the Modern Art Museum of Paris, uh, the Centre uh, Pompidou in Paris, um, and um, the KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, and then, of course, um, I was going to say Minerva um, Cuavez was one of the artists featured in this museum's exhibition, uh, Mexico Inside Out, but she was also most recently in the DMA's um, exhibition of Mexican art. And um, unfortunately, the title of that exhibition is escaping me. Does anybody? I think many of you saw it because I think, in fact, some of you were perhaps introduced to her work with that exhibition. Um, always concerned about um, people having agency and access, Minerva founded um, the Better Life Corporation in 1998 and the International Understanding Foundation in 2016. So it's clear that we're going to love her, right? Um, this evening, Minerva is here to bring together the results of her travels intellectual pursuits and socially charged endeavors in a practice that seeks to make a difference. If you would, please join me in welcoming Minerva Cuavez. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Terry, for the invitation. It's very special. Um, well, I'll go through many different projects, and uh, I decided to start by the, with the microscopic world. Uh, this is called the Bioremediation Project, and um, it's an invitation I rejected uh, twice, because um, there was this uh, initiative in Mexico to do uh, an art project connected to all the garbage in the city. And uh, they were asking us to propose projects that would really make an impact on uh, what was happening with all the trash. And, and uh, I thought uh, any art project wouldn't have an impact on that serious situation. For me, it was like if they were asking me to do something uh, in connection to poverty in the city, it, sounded just impossible. Uh, so I rejected the, the invitation twice, but they said it was that criticism that was interesting for them. Uh, it was the uh, National University and the galleries as part of the university, and also the Goethe Institute uh, from Germany, who were uh, uh, producing the project and inviting German and Mexican artists to develop it. Uh, so at the end, I kind of got convinced and uh, forced me a little bit to think about something that uh, could be a permanent influence on uh, the problem. Uh, but first of all, I didn't see the garbage as the problem. I understood that the, the the problem, um, in fact, was the packaging industry and all uh, uh, capitalist um, uh, 
systems in connection to the production of goods. Um, so for me, the best way to approach this was through research and the university itself. So, well, here you have a description of what is a buyer remediation. And um, I knew that um, a very young student had done experiments in connection to bacteria that could eat plastic and destroy plastic, especially the, the uh, plastic used for uh, bags. Uh, so I started fantasizing about this large um, uh, experiment and destroying all the plastic in the world. Now I had like the super bacteria in mind mm -hmm. and uh, of course I invited uh, researchers to join me and we went to the largest landfill in the galaxy that used to be in Mexico City. Uh, when I step on this landfill I, I realize what capitalism means because uh, it was a large area uh, with uh, garbage classified by year, so you had different kind of um, um, biological processes. At some point you could feel all the heat generated by the bacteria in the land. So we went there um, in search for uh, the bacteria that destroys plastic. We took samples and uh, we managed to get a collection of uh, bacteria. Uh, that's the handsome bacteria we found. Mm -hmm. And I collaborated with a geologist and a chemist. Uh, this is called, uh, in fact, a consortium of bacteria. So it's not that only one destroys or eats plastic, but um, it's a series of them that can destroy plastic. Uh, and the chemist mentioned that we could even uh, work with only the genetic information of these bacteria to uh, develop an experiment. And well, at the end, the uh, research and exhibition happened uh, in a gallery space, also part of the university. Uh, here you have the live bacteria, but the important part is that um, all the research connected to this state um, as part of the university archives and um, they could uh, continue with um, the project and the research. The other interesting part of it is that uh, what happens with the energy of the chemical processes of the bacteria, that potentially could also mean uh, alternative energy. Uh, this is uh, another project also um, produced in Mexico. I was invited to develop um, an artwork uh, connected to climate change. And many of my works connect to uh, ecology and especially um, social ecology because I think that any ecological crisis has to do uh, always with uh, the social crisis we are um, experiencing. So in this case, um, I knew that one of the consequences of climate change uh, uh, is connected to the destruction of coral reef. And in Mexico, uh, we have one part of something called the Mesoamerican coral reef, which is the largest in the world after the Australian one. So uh, I decided to go and see for myself what kind of damage um, has been caused uh, by climate change in that area. And uh, also decided to do an underwater demonstration, uh, which sounds good, but uh, I needed to get certified as a diver and I had no idea about diving. I'd never been ever <laughs> underwater like that. Um, so you have the coral reef, mm, I don't know, in feet, but uh, it's 20 meters. Uh, below the surface. And uh, I got certified in four days and we had to film in two days. So it was challenging, but at the end it was possible. And the main um, objective was to uh, do this underwater demonstration with the statistics or um, the percentages of coral reef uh, left in the world. 
uh, which is less than 1%, and also uh, the percentage of species that depend of that amount of coral reef, which is uh, 25%. And there are more species living underwater than on the surface of Earth. So it's a, a, a big problem, a great crisis, and we are not that aware because somehow it's like under there and we see the horizon, but not the underwater world. Uh, so it was part of the uh, exercise I wanted to do, go and see for myself what was the situation. Uh, another of the banners uh, was that one. Um, it translates as uh, everything is common, because that's uh, one of the problems, that if, uh, if something changes underwater, it doesn't affect only the communities that are on the coast and depend on uh, that environment, but it affects all of us. And we are not aware of, of um, how serious is the problem underwater. Uh, as part of my work, I, I use a lot of uh, uh, graphics. I exploit graphics, uh, you have no idea, with brands, with uh, corporate image a lot. Um, uh, some things are uh, very well known, others not so much, like this um, uh, collage. Um, for me, media at the moment equals power. And advertising has been also very interesting for me to analyze. And the National Geographic magazine, it's a great example of the evolution, not only of the kind of uh, information that is connected to um, mass media research on um, culture, but also ecology, plus the advertising. For me, it's interesting to see how uh, the National Geographic has been advertising watches, flights, cars, at the same time uh, with um, ecological um, issues. And well, now that I mentioned advertising, this is um, a good example of how I use um, graphics um, to channel information. I think what is uh, important for me is to use um, our image bank. We all have all the advertising and, and branding as part of our systems already. Uh, our uh, image bank is, is huge. Once we see something, we cannot erase it voluntarily. Uh, and for me, that's one of the ways I can um, somehow provoke uh, a different reading or an intellectual process. And well, in this case, uh, changing Evian for Egalité was very much commenting on the multicultural uh, aspects of French society, also because the brand is presenting the national uh, French colors, the blue, the red, the white, and uh, well, it says uh, natural condition equality. So it very much um, um, comments on uh, French multiculturalism more than water. I mean, anyone can read uh, the um, alteration or the graphic through their own filters. I'm, I'm totally aware of that. But in this case, it was a response to uh, the French um, political system at the moment. And uh, whenever I alter a graphic, or corporate image, it usually is part of a campaign. It doesn't stay only as a graphic. So on the right-hand side, you can see how water bottles were distributed in a museum space. Uh, we produced, I think, 50,000 water bottles, and they were for free. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's a student from the Rennes University that asked me to borrow the graphic to produce banners and use them in demonstrations uh, when the right wing emerged more evidently in, uh, in France with Le Pen. Uh, and well, for me, that's the best that can happen with one of my works. No, I, I didn't produce it, I didn't document it, they just 
asked to borrow the design. They didn't even have to ask, <laughs> but uh, the the result was uh, well my favorite. Um, and uh, in the case of the water bottles, uh, something I didn't predict was that um, the the graphic exercise was going to appear in many public spaces because then you started seeing the water bottle in parks, in transportation. Children were carrying it around parks because, well, they were for free and they got spread around the city. So usually, um, yes, the graphic works become campaigns. That's another graphic solution um, that was part of the Sao Paulo Biennial. And uh, in that case, it was a, a very large uh, mural painting, uh, but it was graffiti artists who helped me painting it. And the whole um, research was based uh, on site, and it started with a kind of portrait of the Amazons and the companies that are exploiting the natural resources there. So the the black uh, elements are connected to the companies that are uh, either exploiting uh, cellulose or soybeans in, in the area. The airplane was a comment on the uh, economy, because at that time, Barrick, the main airline, uh, got bankrupt. So uh, the lamp I'm using there, it's part of the Barrick airline logo and um, well, it uh, signifies the economic crisis. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, Brasilia that was also planned in the shape of an airplane. So there were references to urbanization, also the military, um, the Indians uh, that have been expelled of their land by the same companies. Um, that's another example of how I um, also intervene public spaces in Mexico. This is, uh, well, it used to be a phone fair in Mexico City, right in the middle of the city and, and right beside two main avenues, patriotism and, and revolution. And uh, you had traffic coming and going all around. And these are electric cars. And when I planned to do this intervention, it was the time when um, there were articles uh, about uh, this new pipeline, the Alaskan pipeline, uh, and I decided to well, basically just put the main oil company's logos on the cards. And the, the comment is very basic, they are all the time crashing with each other and fighting for territories. And those were for free during two weeks. And well, I thought about it as a temporary intervention, but the owners of the fund fair uh, left the um, logos on the cars and it stayed for eight years until, <laughs> until the, the fair disappeared because of all the gentrification process. Now it's buildings in that side, but uh, yeah, it was planned as a temporary intervention. And that's a continuation of uh, how I did research on the oil industry. Uh, well, in fact, I was interested on what had happened with um, a big meteorite that fell in Yucatan in the southeast of Mexico. And um, I realized that uh, there was no interest on, on the archaeology of the site and what had happened with this huge meteorite that meant to kill all the dinosaurs. We are guilty of that. <laughs> the, the thing is that uh, they wanted to find uh, oil in the area. And that's why they found this site where the meteorite fell. Uh, so I went to the uh, main cities where uh, oil is extracted in Mexico, uh, uh, mainly um, Ciudad del Carmen. So the city is totally dedicated to work for Pemex, the national uh, oil company. And uh, when I was there, I also 
witness that there was uh, this um, uh, two months fire in one of the platforms. There was an accident and also all the newspapers were uh, talking about that uh, fire. Uh, so I decided to build this installation based on that kind of research. The photographs you see there are part of, um, uh, well, the daily life of the workers of the platforms because no one can approach those areas. Uh, it's high security areas, so um, the workers take their own photos and then they sell those in the market as postcards. So for me, it was a treasure to, to found those. Uh, there's nothing in that city apart from the oil industry and the monument to the shrimp uh, in the middle of the city, nothing else. Um, but, uh, well, at the end, uh, everything got together to make comments also about uh, marine exploration, the American uh, interest also in the area, and other references to classic um, ecology. And uh, for me, it was also very important to work with tar as material and uh, very much connecting it to the pre-Hispanic use of tar, which was covering um, stone sculptures and uh, other uses. I mean, they even use it as a medical um, uh, element, uh, I think even as uh, uh, tooth fillings, uh, or yeah, just to fix um, dental problems. Um, here you have um, one of the first um, paintings I did in tar, and it was uh, the beginning of a series of paintings. I, I produced it like this, and the connection to, uh, in this case, the Popocatépetl volcano is that um, the main uh, person uh, that made possible the commercial oil extraction in Mexico was a geologist, uh, Ezequiel Ordóñez. He used to write about the volcanoes, the Popocatépetl and the Iztlacíhuatl, and uh, his work was very much academic. And then Shell and other companies were interested in extracting oil in Mexico and were not able to find where to exactly um, uh, have the, how you call them, the, uh, the drilling or, or the, uh, the sites. They couldn't find those. Uh, so at the end, it was a geologist, Ezequiel Ordóñez, who made that possible because he knew so well the orography of Mexico that he was the only person um, uh, that could uh, inform them about that. And, uh, well, this image is part of one of my favorite projects that, in fact, took place in Texas. And um, it's called Crossing the Rio Bravo. And uh, I was invited to do a project for uh, Marfa. And, well, I, I decided I wanted to, of course, um, produce something that could connect both the US and Mexico. So my initial ideas were um, uh, very much about the concept of bridge, building a bridge or, or somehow generating a bridge. I have worked in the past with um, communications like uh, radio and uh, mobile phone uh, autonomous communication. So I thought, well, maybe a free phone connecting both sides uh, or an accident, probably a tree falling uh, or several trees falling uh, over the river. But I had never been in the river area. And finally, I could travel there uh, through uh, Juarez, El Paso, and then uh, got to Marfa, and then someone uh, took me to the area of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, and I realized it was not one river, it was many different rivers, and historically, the border is not only the river, but the deepest part of the river. And it was under a canyon, it was dry, it could split in two, 
so little by little, the concept of uh, border was abstract. There was no border, and there were no signs. There were border patrols now and then, uh, but. I realized, okay, the, the most powerful thing here is not surveillance, it's not um, a limit, but uh, the desert itself, the environment. And I found a site like this and um, decided to use the rocks to mark which way you could cross from one side to the other and build the bridge in this way. Um, it was limestone, so uh, natural material also. Um, and stop there. But, uh -huh. So I ended up marking this dotted line between the U.S. and Mexico, and ended up crossing from the U.S. to Mexico and back. I only had a, a zip lock with my passport, <laughs> and, and that was it. <laughs> Uh, the water was up to my belly button, and um, there were three people with me. Also, we uh, did another artwork in the area, but one was mainly guiding us, another one taking the photographic documentation, and they were American, and they also said that um, they felt liberated while I was crossing, because uh, even for them, uh, it was illegal to, to uh, step inside the river. So for me, it was liberating uh, from the political imaginary connected to the border. Again, you know, all this violence and surveillance and control, uh, it was not there. And that was really important. I mean, not only as an artwork, but uh, experiencing it as a person, it was um, really valuable. So after this uh, action or experience, um, I also had some relics from the area and decided to build an installation work. And there you see a slideshow of how I'm uh, painting and crossing uh, the Rio Bravo River. Uh, you have also uh, elements that uh, relate to the river uh, books. Uh, also, the walking stick was important because I consider that the piece uh, was also connected to the concept of walking as a political activity. I mean, there was nothing more political on that uh, geographical area than walking from south to north. That was it. And I've been also exploring that in connection to um, uh, public demonstrations. I, uh, well, I have a studio space in Mexico uh, City in the historical center, and there can be uh, four demonstrations every day. And uh, you start wondering, is it effective? Is it still meaningful to go to the streets and demonstrate? Uh, I think it is. There is a very special energy that is uh, impossible to generate uh, in any other way, but uh, in this case, also walking as a political act was a, a main um, uh, part of, of the action. Uh, I collected also rocks. You see also a little bit of uh, a flask with um, the river water, uh, flowers also, um, the disposed cans by immigrants that I could find, uh, maps of the area. I even found a National Geographic magazine also talking about this uh, specific area with uh, this shocking image of someone closing the, the gate uh, of the United States. I think it's from the 70s, the magazine, but it has been really uh, valuable for some projects. And well, now that I mentioned immigration, um, this other project happened in Europe, in Spain. And there, as I was asked to develop a 
public art project, I went around a neighborhood called Lava Pies, and uh, it's a very multicultural neighborhood, but I also noticed that it was under this gentrification process. So most of the people living there, um, uh, I mean, these musicians, for example, they would go to other areas of the city to play as buskers and ask um, only tips. Uh, and uh, I decided to organize a concert for the neighborhood, but um, uh, then I have to gather them back there. So I distributed flyers and posters inviting uh, musicians of any nationality that would play any kind of music uh, to join the concert for the neighborhood, and they were going to be uh, paid as musicians for the concert. They had to play only half an hour, and they had to play what they usually play at the same time, and they didn't do any rehearsal, no one was directing them, and I thought, okay, it's going to be orchestral noise, but they'll be together. <laughs> but what happened is that um, when they got together and started playing, they found this common rhythm and I mean, if I were a musician, probably I could have guessed that they were going to find this harmony and communication. But uh, well, uh, that's, I guess, what happens with uh, art projects like this. I'm not a musician, I'm not a sociologist, but I can uh, put these elements together and then something happens. It's very much a cultural experiment. Uh, so what happened is, yeah, they, they uh, found harmony and communication, even though they were also from many different nationalities. And at the back, there was even an invented instrument by some artist, some punk uh, group also playing accordions, solo musicians, uh, samba, ro uh, um, yeah, all kinds of uh, rumba and... and uh, well, they uh, played together and they didn't play half an hour, they played for one hour because uh, they were enjoying the people from the neighborhood also came out of their places and uh, danced a bit when the uh, Cuban song was a little bit more evident. Uh, that was good already. But two years after this happened, um, the organizers of the exhibition told me that they knew that some of these musicians uh, had gathered again and played another concert totally independently from that original organization. So again, it's the best uh, that can happen with a project like this, and it's totally unpredictable. So yeah, now we are in the International Understanding Foundation that also, um, uh, it's linked to this um, uh, desire to, to bring people together through culture and just develop uh, a language um, that could um, oppose racism and, um, well, in general, to bring people together through culture. Uh, in this case, the first exercise happened in Germany, in Cologne, uh, at the Ludwig Museum. It was their 40th anniversary, so they invited artists to uh, respond to the collection they have. They have uh, one of the largest uh, Picasso's collection. Uh, I mean, it's a vast uh, collection. and. Um, uh, there, what I wanted to do is uh, research the archives of the museum. And uh, I learned that, uh, well, they have all these files about the public response to some artworks. And one of the most controversial was the Mondrian, the only Mondrian they own. Uh, was very problematic to be part of the collection because it was expensive at the time when they bought it. 
Uh, so you got all this public reaction about the price and why buying something that expensive. Uh, so they have this big file. They have others that are connected to uh, 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 probably uh, religious content, etc. So that was very interesting for me, and I decided to use that only Mondrian as a kind of floor plan for a structure. So you see on the right-hand side how we plan to use the original Mondrian to build the, the structure that was going to host all these other artworks. Also responding to the collection, like, well, the blue area uh, included a sculpture of mine also um, related to an Andy Warhol painting, one of the uh, catas catastrophe paintings. Uh, so I found the original article that Andy Warhol saw to uh, produce the painting. And uh, for me, it was also a connection to how he used um, social and cultural events as part of his work. and somehow at the end the context was uh, reflected on his own work. Uh, on the right hand side there you see uh, a Mexican mask uh, that was uh, for me shocking that it's so minimal. I mean there is no color, it's, it's just like that, black. Uh, but it reminded me of uh, a group in Cologne called the Cologne Progressives that produce all those kind of graphics, uh, all of them connected to social and political uh, issues. And in fact, they are the base of the modern or the contemporary uh, graphic image. All the infographics that are developed nowadays, the sim simple icons come from that kind of uh, graphic example. And well, for me, both things had a lot to do, and I wanted to comment on the Colon progressives. Um, and another great thing to find was um, this photograph of a rock band in the 80s, uh, also using the Colon progressives graphics on the left hand side. What they are using as a banner is this early graphic from the 20s. Uh, so for me, that was another uh, proof of how uh, something that is part of the art context or part of culture can uh, influence and live through um, uh, different generations. But yeah, it was uh, very special to see first the paintings in the museum, then uh, the graphics that are based of the uh, contemporary graphics now, and also uh, seeing that someone in the 80s, a uh, punk rock band, used it. And, uh, well, this is a very new research uh, project. Uh, I'm invited to the San Francisco MoMA and the Cadist uh, Foundation in, in San Francisco to develop a project um, in connection to public knowledge. And when I started thinking about public knowledge, I immediately thought that probably fire was this early knowledge that um, uh, is the origin to all uh, civilization. And then also thought, okay, it's an interesting combination, fire and, and libraries, because the, the project is meant to happen in all the uh, San Francisco public libraries. Um, it's huge, because they, um, uh, they have seven million visitors a year. So for me, that's also an ideal situation, the best context to uh, produce an artwork or an intervention. Uh, so yeah, I started playing uh, with the idea of fire and how much it's so um, uh, 
opposed to the idea of libraries and then uh, book burning as this political um, historical fact uh, to using fire as part of social protest that everything started to come together and um, I found that even the, the public libraries had fire in their original logo. Uh, so they have the Phoenix, uh, but also fire, um, because San Francisco uh, is a city that also has suffered a lot from uh, fires, and the whole city has been transformed through um, the fires there. So it, it became really uh, complex and, and then uh, many other um, elements came together, like uh, the historical photographs of the fires there. Um, what I want to do is intervene not only the, uh, the bookshelves in the libraries, but also probably generate some kind of bookmarks in the city that tell you about what has happened or how the city was transformed uh, through the fires there. Um, so again, I'm, I'm fantasizing uh, with this intervention on the bookshelves, but probably also a TV show, uh, some kind of uh, TV style production that um, uh, can present interviews about uh, public knowledge about the life in libraries. Listening to the librarians was very interesting because um, uh, I learned many anecdotes, but also it made me think about um, uh, how books have been censored, and they mentioned that they have uh, users that one, for example, a man that used to cut the books uh, censoring uh, any uh, gay or homosexual uh, related content from them and uh, they organized and they caught him and they managed to get what well, he was just hiding the uh, paper cuts under the, the tables. They managed to cut him but then later they organized an exhibition with all the cutouts of the uh, censored books, and that's the best solution ever. Uh, so I'm, I'm really trusting the librarians to give me more feedback. They talk about a man that goes there with his iguana, as uh, <laughs> you know, um, how you call the, the the animals that you can carry like around. Well, it's an iguana; it's not a dog. He goes as uh, emotional support. Uh, but uh, those kind of stories, it's for me uh, research. For me, research doesn't mean Googling, it doesn't mean going through um, bibliography, it means I need to talk with someone from the local context and um, get this information through them and also I'm trusting them as the filter of information. So for me, it's uh, essential to go and meet someone that is familiar with the context and that will give me uh, uh, his view and uh, his uh, feedback and filter so much uh, the, the context uh, for me. And well, that's the presentation. Thank you very much. That's my contact with you. Later. Yes, I think that's the most important part of the talk. So please ask some questions. I was just saying to my friend here, I was really glad you spoke about what you think of as research at the end of your talk. And I'm actually finding myself hungry for more. Um, the way you think about research and frame it for these projects, because it must also change the nature of the project. So San Francisco versus the reefs, um, um, you know, garbage biomedical. So I'm curious if you could just expand a little bit more about how you think <coughs> of your research and your process. Yes, I think I, even though I have a very um, uh, personal political position, I think 
to avoid uh, having closed statements. Um, uh, yeah, there is of course a, a, a point of view, but uh, usually the artwork is final when there is this intellectual process. Um, and that's why I mean, what, why I say that uh, my work is research, because uh, it's not projects that you can recognize uh, as being solved with a very specific formal solution. It's not that I only produce mural paintings or um, a special kind of graphics. No, it's, it's the research what uh, connects all of them. No, even though uh, there are some that doesn't seem uh, developed in the same way, like the Better Life Corporation, these interventions in urban spaces. They started in Mexico City distributing um, free subway tickets or lowering the price in supermarkets, uh, just changing the barcode. Um, and uh, these interventions were the starting point for developing the graphic campaigns, and they connect, for example, to the uh, Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo project, through probably the same intention of finding the, this uh, freedom gap where you can still exercise some agency, and just realizing that it's possible to make a student ID card that is not fake, it's part of my project. I say you are a student, part of my project, and then you can use it for discounts, etc. That's a strategy. But it's so similar to, oh, let's go to the river and see, how is it? It's, it's the same kind of um, uh, mechanism there. And um, uh, in those cases, Again, being confronted to the context, it what, it's what triggers um, this uh, research exercise. It's, it's witnessing, but it's also very much connected to intuition. And the, well, in, I sometimes call it the human interface. And it's this filter, you know? It's like, if I want to learn about Texas, Fort Worth, I'll ask you. No, I, w I won't trust Google at all. No, Google is, a, is a, a f a, another kind of filter. So I would ask you, and, and that's what I mean with uh, research. And well, um, that's what I also try to uh, push a little bit when, when I'm invited to produce new work. Is like, yes, but I, I need to do research, and that means meeting the, the right kind of people. And that's also the best part of the production of the projects, meeting the best people in the world. For me, that's not only part of my own education. I mean, at the end, more than making statements, it's also a learning process. And yeah, it's so enjoyable. Thank you. You mentioned walking, and I forgot what you said about it, but I'm interested in hearing more about your thoughts on walking. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think before the uh, Rio Bravo project, uh, I started wondering um, uh, how much the demonstrations are generating an impact, a political impact. And um, uh, we have so many in Mexico City that uh, I wish I could somehow prove <laughs> no, that, that they work. What, what was that? kind of special uh, energy generated. Um, uh, but then I, I learned about other groups also uh, using uh, walking as a political tool. And I think for the uh, situationist, it was also a main element in their practice. So little by little, I, I connected those things. But um, probably in the case of the Rio Bravo project, um, thinking about all the uh, immigration going through that area, and not only human uh, immigration. Uh, I think I'm uh, more concerned about what would happen uh, with a wall or, or a fence or any limit to um, the animals uh, having to 
uh, move from one uh, climate to the other because that's their natural uh, way to survive. Know what's happening to them. I mean, uh, human trafficking is going to continue. Drug trafficking is going to continue. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm more concerned to what's happening with all the uh, natural movement and transit uh, in those areas. So it's part of that. But um, yeah, I started thinking about that, uh, seeing the context of, of Mexico City and seeing how uh, also people from other states of the country had to go to Mexico City and demonstrate there because it's the political stage. You know? the, the Zócalo in Mexico City, it's where you have to be. If not, you are not seen. And that involves walking and that involves seeing people that has never been in a urban environment. You no, know? it's indigenous people that see the fine arts palace for the first time. You no, know? and, and you see how their faces are just <laughs> turning around the, the city and, and they, are, they are shocked and mesmerized and um, it's uh, interesting. So I, I do think that uh, demonstrations are the only way to gather this human energy and uh, see that you are there in community with the other. Uh, you don't have to agree. <laughs> Almost no one would agree in, in such a large group of people, but um, the, the energy uh, generated, I think it's um, unique. And I don't see in which other way that, that could be um, uh, made or, or generated. Yeah. So how do you reconcile your place in this uh, process of research and the impact of the statements that are generated from this research. I know you've talked about the resistance to uh, starting the garbage project because it didn't sort of satisfy the, the results that you could get uh, making an artwork around that sort of um, massive project. Uh, do you find yourself um, like how do you how do you place yourself in that space? Because on the one hand, it almost seems like even walking or protesting or or making something out of the research uh, feels futile in the the face of the the gravity or the enormity of any situation. But then it also feels uh, necessary to uh, produce the work that comes out of that research. Um, let me see. Uh, I think um, there is a big difference between an art project and uh, an activist action, and it's it's very common to uh, mix both of them with the contemporary practices or how much. Uh, graphic or art artistic elements we can see in um, activism, you know, from Greenpeace to the women's demonstration. I mean, they are creative as well. But I think with um, political activism, uh, there is a way to measure results. And uh, what happened with the uh, aesthetic pra practices or exercises is that there is no real way to measure them, and that's part of the freedom. And I think I mentioned it with the uh, project in Madrid with the musicians. You know, it was putting together elements that uh, a mu musician was not going to do and a sociologist was not going to do, and it could only happen within the uh, context of the contemporary art practice. And also, we cannot predict the results. I had no thesis to prove. And uh, it was yeah, uh, an amazing result that they got together again after two years and played another concert. So if that can't happen through a different practice, I don't know. But I think only through um, contemporary art is possible. And that's what I mean with this um, uh, kind of um, 
uh, very, uh, I think, clear political position from my side, but avoiding uh, closed statements. No, I'm always trusting the audience uh, to use their own filters and process the graphic and um, the information uh, elements as part of the works and then produce their own final work. No? So I think the research, the aesthetic elements and the audience work at the same level. So I don't have, a, as I said, a very specific uh, formal solution for the works. No, it gets developed depending also of who's going to uh, see it or approach it. Uh, they're having times when they ask me for a performance piece and the first thing I develop is a graphic and it's like, okay, now how do I translate it? But all the time it's this constant translation from research to the, the visual elements or the uh, finding this gap of freedom and exercising something that can enhance that or, yeah, it's, I think that's uh, very much how I um, understand uh, research and also um, taking a position without taking uh, uh, or closing the statement. Thank you. How did your life lead you to this work? Ah. <laughs> um, well, uh, both of my parents are primary school teachers and uh, probably it started from there, even though they didn't uh, want to uh, decide for me like which career I was going to take, uh, they were an influence. Uh, my father is uh, more politically oriented and very socially engaged. So probably from that kind of background, um, I, I got my uh, interest in, in social and political issues, but um, when I started producing art or when I started deciding which career I was going to follow, it crossed my mind uh, studying literature or philosophy, and it had nothing to do with uh, social or political work, but at some point, um, it was logical to uh, just mix those interests and, or put them together. And uh, yeah, then from that point, my practice uh, became just more enjoyable and it was flowing much better. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Have you ever been in trouble or felt threatened by any corporations or entities because of the work that you do? Mm, no, but, uh, well, there have been some uh, situations. I have a, uh, an action using uh, Ronald McDonald, uh, the character. Uh, well, I'll tell you first about that uh, action. Uh, I uh, produced this work for the first time in Paris and um, the museum, the Palais de Tokyo, found an actor that um, could learn all the information I had about the unethical practices about McDonald's, uh, including uh, the chemicals in the food, uh, the uh, uh, labor issues, uh, the links with the military, uh, how much property they own in the world. I think after the Vatican, they are the second owner of uh, real estate in the world. Uh, yeah, those kind of <laughs> things. So um, he was dressed very much as uh, Ronald and uh, with some alterations in the costume, uh, but he was not protesting outside the restaurant. Uh, uh, he was inviting people to go inside the restaurant and eat there, but at the same time, he was being very honest about um, the kind of food they were going to uh, eat. And um, uh, nothing happened, but then uh, when I used uh, that image, the photograph of this uh, Ronald McDonald as part of an invitation card, 
for another show in Mexico City, the public relations company uh, that was working for McDonald's contacted me and uh, they said they wanted me, they wanted to invite me for breakfast or lunch. And I said, okay, that's assassination attempt, uh, <laughs> something like that. But I was really busy with the show there. It was a solo show with more than 20 projects at the same time. And they wanted to meet me in a very specific restaurant, a very specific time, and it was just impossible. I said, that's strange. But the thing is that when I was 15 years old, I worked for a McDonald's. That was my first job ever. Because um, you couldn't get any other kind of job, almost, in, in Mexico at that age. Uh, so I knew everything about the, the restaurant in Fagno, from the fryers to the um, freezers, you name it. I knew everything. So uh, I just ignored them, and, and they didn't go back to me. But that was one, one time. And I think, um, uh, in general, well, what happens within the art context usually uh, doesn't reach uh, much of the uh, larger uh, society or where the corporations operate until now. It's, it's happening more and more. But, um, I think I would use uh, the information that is part of the works uh, as also a kind of potential um, statement. You know, if they react, I'll also react saying, okay, this is public information that I'm reproducing and translating into an artwork because that's a key thing. You Not know, all the facts that are connected to those kind of actions uh, having already published by journalists or uh, very well-known magazines. Uh, so yeah, I would use it as a, an opportunity to make the uh, information more visible because it has happened like that in, in the past with some um, activists uh, doing that. There are very uh, big examples about that. Uh, but in, in general, nothing has happened. Uh, one bank in Mexico City reacted to one of the shows because they lent uh, furniture. Uh, it's so hard without seeing the images, but this Spanish bank lent some furniture, but also they lent um, the big mascot costume that is in fact a pig dressed as Robin Hood. I thought it's perfect, it's a bank using the pig, which is the symbol of greed and accumulation as their mascot, this, that is ideal. I didn't do anything. I just put them in the museum. <laughs> and they were glad because they didn't have to put any money. They were just lending old furniture and the mascot. And it was like, OK, free advertising for us in this big museum. And at the end, they decided to take the pigs away from the exhibition because they realized, OK, maybe this is not the ideal context. <laughs> they knew about the whole project. They got a, a, a dossier with uh, the plan for the exhibition and all the elements. They just thought it was free advertising, and they lent the pigs and the furniture. They took the pigs. They left the furniture. Um, but that was a, a great um, uh, situation at the end because, uh, I mean, we were used to religious uh, censorship or political censorship or sexual censorship, but not corporate censorship. And it was the first case in, in the Mexican cultural context that something like that took place. You know? So uh, the bank complaining about the museum and the museum uh, saying, well, we show you. It was so flattering. <laughs> it was so <laughs> flattering. So it was the best that could happen. Thank you. Thank you. How are we? That's lovely. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much.